Intelligence High School Debate. Hello and welcome to Intelligence High School Debate. I'm your host, Seo Misora. Now here in Korea, there's a concept called Eo which is about beating the summer heat with an even stronger heat. And on today's episode of Intelligence, we will try to beat the August summer heat with the burning passion of our students. But first, let's check out the rules of the British Parliamentary Debate format. This tournament adapts the British Parliamentary style. The debate consists of four teams of two speakers with two teams on either side of the case. Each speaker should deliver a five-minute speech, and teams gain points individually even if on the same side. The first and last minute of each speech is protected from the point of information. Time to meet our students. Teams and sides are chosen by drawing lots, so each team, please randomly select a scroll. It will have your team position written on it. First up are the students from Bichu Hall Foreign Language High School, students Shin Won and Lee Jung Hyun. They have selected Closing Government. <laughs> Next up are Hanya High School students Park Chung Hoon and Park Min So. They've selected Opening Opposition. <laughs> Continuing on, Gongju National University High School students Park Jae Sob and Park Na In. Their scroll reads Closing Opposition. And that, of course, means that Korean Minjok Leadership Academy students Han Yeju and Park Jin Ha will be assuming the position opening government. There it is, opening government. <laughs> Here are your teams once again on opening government, Korean Minjok Leadership Academy. Hoiting. And going in direct opposition is the opening opposition, Han Yeul High School. Han Yeul, Han Yeul, Hoiting. Okay, and the closing team, the closing government, Mitsu Hall Foreign Language High School. Mitsu, Mego, Cross. And finally, the closing opposition, Gongju National University High School. Gongju, Hadebugo, yeah. yeah. Well, this is signing is about whether we want to the have a list of rules or not. We are now ready to make a call. So, pass. We can be affected by the international relationship as you all know, just like Korea and Japan. Um, and it's since definitely a they must be basically approved. Okay, those were your eight students. Time to meet our three adjudicators. First, Sandeep Shilani from Hong Kong, <laughs> Deputy Chief Adjudicator of the United Asian Debating Championships. Next, we have Professor Joshua Park, member of the Executive Committee of the World Schools Debating Championships. And Professor Tebore Sanamgun from Thailand, founder and chief adjudicator of the Thailand High School National Debating Championship. And last but not least, we're also joined by 50 audience judges right here in the studio. They will be turning their lights on when they are persuaded by a speaker. All right, let's check out the motion for today's debate. War is cruel. It fills our hearts with hatred and incurable wounds with all the crimes against humanity. However, most of the government resolutions of war atrocities have been made without the approval of victims. Should these resolutions be made to restore the victim's honor through etiquette measures or for the mutual cooperation between countries? This House believes that any official government resolution of war atrocity must receive the approval of victims. Government resolutions of war atrocities are necessary to promote peace and diplomatic relations. But governments also have a duty to give victims the chance to receive the justice, apology and truth that they deserve. The students are given only 30 minutes to prepare for their speeches. And that fierce debate is about to begin. Let's hear from our students. They have had 30 minutes to prepare their case. First, Prime Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, wars do not like distinguish individuals based on their will. That is to say, when it comes to the context of modern war, war victims are not only limited to people who opt in to participate in wars, like, like soldiers, for example. Because oftentimes wars include things like bombing other countries or bombing other like sites and towns, innocent civilians are killed and robbed during the process. 
And thus, ladies and gentlemen, in this debate, we're going to prove to you, first of all, why it's the government's role to care about these victims, and secondly, extend that to saying as to why it should be a law or a rule for the uh, governments and countries to follow. So before we go on to these two arguments, the judge's metrics in this debate should be basically about who makes a resolution that embraces and incorporates the voices of all stakeholders and all victims in, uh, when the wars happen. So basically, we have first argument is about government's role. Like, why should the government care about these individuals and victims? We have three analysis. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, basically, this represents the government's failure to protect their citizens. Basically, the war's atrocities and victims of these war atrocities mean that the government's fail to fulfill its duty of protecting these individuals and protecting their civilians from like being sacrificed over such a big kind of uh, catastrophe and mayhem. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that it's the government's duty to actually cure the the pain and psychological traumas that these individuals faced during the sacrifice. And our second analysis is about the, how there's no other means for the victims to stand up on their own after the war. Because if you look at after the war, like post-war situations, we see a lot of the times where victims are shunned by the society. Comfort women, for example, were shunned because of the scarlet letter on their heads saying that these people are sex slaves, right? So we believe that a lot of the times there's no other stakeholders uh, but the government to care and intervene into the lives of these victims and say that we're going to do something better for your lives. And our last analysis is about why uh, what kind of like message this resolution holds in the first place. We believe that these resolutions in the first place holds the meaning and represents all the voices, incorporates all the voices of the citizens because it's a post like mutual kind of uh, agreement uh, of the governments and of countries. And thus basically signing, the country signing the resolution means that the victims are now ready to move on where these victims are apparently, apparently not. So these are why the government should care, these three analysis as to why the government has the duty to fulfill its role of helping these individuals. And then let's move on to our second argument of explaining why we are making this a law, why we are making this a binding rule for these countries to follow. Because we see a severe lack in the status quo. Because we see that the status quo does not listen to the voices of these victims. If you see the Iraq resolution, for example, ladies and gentlemen, all the money were not used for the victims. These money were all used to build infrastructures for the Iraq, like the post-war uh, er, uh, post, like, era for these Iraq, Iraqis. And secondly, if you look at Korean Japan negotiation on 1965, you see a lot of the times where the victims' voices were unheard, where all the money was used to build POSCO, that big metal company over in Pohang. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, we see here by the status quo how these kind of nations do, uh, have like lack the incentive to care for their individual citizens or these victims. Why is this so? Because most of the cases, these victims are from like regions or areas where countries gave up on during the war. Like these are like uh, where countries or regions at the edge of the borders where countries like have gave, give, given up on from the first when the war started. So in this case, these people already do not have enough political and economic status because they live in such a like a poor and shabby place. And then, but secondly, after the war, where these people were like robbed, like economically robbed or like raped or basically killed, their family members killed. Now these people are more like pushed to the cliffs, where these people have no political or economic power at all. And in most of the times after the war, the media narrative focus and uh, the media narrative is dominated by like kind of positive kind of like uh, points for the war, right? People who are benefited from the wars are only like mentioned in these media cases. So most of the times these victims are not like aware of. And so people are, don't, know, don't know about the victims. If you see for the comfort woman cases, after 20 years at last, these people were heard of their voices. So most, most of the times, ladies and gentlemen, these people lack, the government and the society lacks the incentive to care for the victims. And thus, ladies and gentlemen, our policy changed this, our rule changed it. By making it a rule for these country to abide by, by making it impossible to like go on with their negotiation process if it's not for the approval of the victims. We make these people he hear the voices of these victims who are shunned by the society, ladies and gentlemen. So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, victims' voices are small. They have minor stances in our society, right? After these people are economically robbed, these people are killed, these people are raped. There's nobody who wants to like focus on their voices and listen to the voices. We make people hear, we make the government officials pay up and compensate for the pains and the traumas that these people face. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, we take this debate home. Thank you. Okay, that was the Prime Minister arguing for the motion, and one of the points raised by the Prime Minister was that government resolutions are often the only chance to heal the wounds of victims who have been shunned by the society. I'm seeing a lot of lights have been turned on. Let's see the exact number. 43 out of 50. Well done. Let's continue on. The Leader of Opposition, please step forward to the podium. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am the leader of the opposition, and I am going to rebut the points made by our um, government side. First of all, um, I want to ask you that um, the overall overall topic of this debate is whether we should get an approval from the victims whether uh, to pass our law or resolution. However, you gave us the points that whether we should help the victims or not. So I think it is kind of um, irrelevant to our topic. And now I'm going to begin my argument. In this world, a lot of battles are ongoing and has caused many violent and atrocious uh, actions. Um, by the government or even by the forces. To resolve these actions, the government side is insisting that um, the official government should receive the concurrence of, a, um, of sufferers. However, this House believes that this argument has some major problems. First of all, I think it could delay the problems of a country caused by a war that needs to be resolved as fast as possible. There is a really good example that is happening now in Korea. There, um, there has been a lot of problems, such as sex slaves um, by Japanese, Japanese armies. However, um, these were sex slaves, especially uh, who are part of Japanese colony, are not actually being well compensated because these women are dying without getting proper resolution due to government's action of getting approval from every woman. Yes, ma'am. The reason why these women are incapable of being compensated right now is because the government has no incentive to care for them. Mm -hmm. We create an incentive for the governments to care. How does the incentive be created on your side? Um, actually, now government is trying to build a statue of a statue of a woman sex slave, and they're trying really hard to get um, give compensation. But these women are claiming their rights and. Um, claiming that they're a victim and they need to get a approval. So that's why our, po our team thinks that getting, uh, getting these approvals is causing these women to get vic um, become harder for government to compensate them. Um, and um, I think we should give... Uh, yeah, I think that's all of my points given. Thank you. Okay, would you like to end your speech there, or would you like to accept more points of information? I would like to accept more so, points of information. So do you think it would be better for Korea to just like shut these women up and just move on quickly to like negotiate with Japan and like take that money and pay off for the POSCO or like mining companies or like metal um, companies? I did not say that in a way. I think we should get compensated from Japanese government, but the, the, uh, I think it, like getting approval from every woman, rom, women who got um, victimized by Japanese is taking too much time. And I think these long time, like 70 years, is causing a lot of women to pass away. So they're not getting well compensated. So I think, um, I'm not saying that we should build, like, build infrastructure like POSCO, but I think um, by getting quicker help from Japan, or quicker compensation from Japan, I think it is better to it could be better to compensate to these sex slaves as fast as possible. Thank you. Okay, that was a leader of opposition arguing against the motion. Uh, be he said that getting victim approval would unnecessarily delay the formulation of resolutions. Okay, not too many lights have been switched on. The number is one out of 50. Okay, we continue on with the Deputy Prime Minister. Please step forward to the podium. First of all, I'm going to respond to the lack of engagement coming from opening opposition. Because basically what they said to the very well-nuanced Prime Minister argument and anal analysis is, well, you get slower negotiations on your side. First of all, we're going to respond by saying that the comparative on your side is a fast resolution that does not encompass the ideas and ideologies of all stakeholders who have been harmed as a result of war. I think our Prime Minister pretty much gave you a, a clear reason and analysis as to why 
why that happens. But secondly, and more importantly, I'm also going to say that negotiations get worse under your side. Why is that the case? Because we think that war resolution shouldn't simply be about what happened during the war and what we're going to do in order to stop the war and end the war. It should also be about what the, what the relationship between the two countries look like in the future. That is, it is also about curing the resentment that has been built up as a result of the war. And at the point that the people of the country feel like their victims have not been compensated, at the point that victims feel like they can no longer maintain a working relationship with the opposing country, we think that that builds further resentment for the negotiation, but further for the relationship with that other country, which is harming the mutual relationships of those two countries. But thirdly, we think that we also create mechanisms to stop delays that are on our side. Because on your side, victims are going to be working as individuals who want to combat the idea, who want to make their voices heard. But on our side, in which victims do have the in which governments have the incentive to listen to the approval of victims. We think it motivates victims to voice out more, but we think it also motivates victims to voice their, like, to voice their opinions and the harms that they have faced in, a, in the most effective way possible. That is, they want to do it in an effective way because they know that the government cares. We think that that leads to the formation of groups that do care for victims or coalitions amongst victims that help these individuals get what they were harmed as as a result of the war. But secondly, we think that their only response to our argument is, well, this motion is about whether you want to have illicit approval or not, so why do you make an entire argumentation of why the government should care? We think that that argumentation is particularly important because it is a principal reason as to what the government should do regardless of what the status quo looks like. We think that the government is principally obligated to care for the citizens that it failed to protect during the war, that it, like, that it used as tools and expenses to win the war. And therefore, we think because they failed to respond to our principal argumentation, that's why opening government is still taking this debate. But secondly, let's do some extensions and expansions as to why this like, policy or code of conduct is particularly necessary, especially in the era of modern warfare. And I'm going to tell you about how wars are changing in the status quo and why this rule is particularly necessary given the context of modern wars. Because we think wars have change from the past. Because in the past, when people died in wars, you got to empathize with that person's death because you understood that that was someone as your own, that that was someone who could also be killed as a result of a draft coming from your country. Whereas in the status quo, we think deaths are something that become numbers. We think that attacks on villages are, be are becoming more and more technical and mechanized as a result of the development of things like technology, as a result of, developing, uh, of the development of mass weaponry. That's why during the Iraq war, basically the US media it failed to, failed to like, build empathy from the people that lived within the United States because they did not understand what the victims as individuals were going through during that war. There's zero focus on individuals that do, or start, like, that do die or suffer as a result of war. And our view of war has become something technical and mechanical. And we think that that's made the very barrier for war very low. That, 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 that means that it's made going to war very very easy. War is something that's more like a computer game rather than a, an atrocious activity in which people die. We think that we create a code of conduct by shifting the discourse of war to victims. We think that we provide a counter narrative in a society in which war is something technical, mechanical, robotic. We think that it provides the idea that victims' lives are also important. It creates the recognition that human lives are sacrificed in massive numbers as a result of war. It creates the recognition that human lives and rights are still important during the process of war. We think this is especially important in this debate because we think that war resolutions exist ultimately to protect the humans. We think that wars, although they're going to be sometimes atrocious, there needs to be a barrier as to how much rights we can actually sacrifice. We think we create that barrier by saying that you are going to be, have to be responsible for whatever sacrifice you make of your own humans, whatever sacrifice you make of your own citizens. But moreover, we think it incentivizes citizens and countries to actually care about people we're very proud to propose. Okay, that was the Deputy Prime Minister arguing for the motion and one of her arguments was that giving victims a chance to get justice and apology would go a long way in improving future international relations. Let's find out how many number, how many lights have been switched on. 33 out of 50, so over 65%, well done. We move on to the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Please step forward to the podium. Hello, this is the deputy leader of the uh, opening opposition. 
And I think, ladies and gentlemen, this debate has lost conversation because we are talking about different things. Let's read this motion aloud. This House believes that any official government resolution of war atrocities must receive the approval of victims. The motion is about should the government get approvals from the victims. However, however the, the opening government gave arguments about should the government help the victims. Of course, we agree on this part. The government should, hel the government should help the victims because they were at the war. However, talking about should the government help the victims by getting their approval is a different, different project and a different debate. So we want to get this straight and then I'll, uh, the, all the refutations and the, all the rebuttals are related to what I say right now. The re debate is not related to the motion itself. So uh, I will get straight to my points. Firstly, we have two points and first one is efficiency. So point one, the resolution of war atrocities give effects to one's nation's economy and law forms and social statuses and social atmospheres and all kinds of factors and even global relationships. Point two, the nation, the government itself knows the best of what's important for their nation and what's important for the citizens itself. So we could say that the nation and the government itself is the best expert at this kind of project about changing the relationships with other nations and changing the policies Sir, of one nation. Yes, ma'am. If what the government thinks is best for the nation does not benefit the victims at all, are you willing to bite the bullet and say that the government should pass that resolution? I mean that the government, government should know. The government knows that the victims has a problem in the war. So that I, didn't, I did not say that the government should just neglect all the conversations with the victims. I say that the approvals of between the victims and the government is not needed. But we still should help the victims in another way, just as an approval. So the, we have a conclusion. After considering and gathering the victims and the citizens' opinions about the resolving process, the government's changing their actions fluidly is the most efficient, efficient way in the whole nation. Resolving is not just a simple process. It needs all the citizens' opinions and consider all this national nation's status quo and the economic status in the current world. So uh, our third argument is about equality. So point one, some might say, huh, equality? How can they say it's equal if they are not getting approvals from the victims? However, let's think about who are directly involved in this resolving process and the war. I, uh, gave, I will give you four groups of people. First one, the victims who were at the war. And second, the past government that was also involved at war. And third, the current government who resolves problems now. And the fourth, us. We are involved also in this kind of resolution process, the resolving process. So, yes, the war occurred in the past. However, the change and the resolution, the resolving process occurs in the present, which means that we are also involved in this changing process. So, we, our, our opposition team thought, thinks that we also have needs our approval or disapproval to this kind of process. So we can be affected by the international relationship, as you all know, just like Korea and Japan. We are getting negative relationships from Japan because of Korean government. So we are living in the world where change happens. And so, conclusionally, we also should have a right to approve or disapprove. Plus, in Korea, we are in a democratic nation. So the motion tells us we should get approvals of the victims. Of course, the approvals of the victims are important. However, the opposition team thinks even the victims' responsibility and their, their approvals are important. The citizen, the current citizens' approvals, approvals are also important, just as the victims' approvals are important as well. Thank you. Okay, that was a deputy leader of opposition arguing against the motion. According to the speaker, there are other, there are better ways to engage with the victims than requiring approval from them. Okay, let's see how many lights have been switched on. 35 out of 50. Well done. And that concludes the top half of today's debate. Before we continue, I would like to ask our three adjudicators on how they saw the debate so far. Professor Sanamgan. Opening government has always been an important key role in the debate by first being able to establish the context and understand the debate holistically. Why are we here? Why are we here debating this motion? And secondly, to build a case on argumentation to defend the debate itself. 
I think the first part wasn't much there yet in your case because it seemed to me that you never considered on the moving forward process but saying that we just need these people to include these people in and that's like an ultimate thing to do. I think that's why if I would recommend, I think it's very importantly, explain how including these individuals will make things better. Including these things actually makes me move forward, be able to have common ground or even conclusions in discussion, etc. I think that makes your, your debate more positive. So for the opening opposition, the first thing I'd like to say is that you guys really had a fantastic distinction. Both of you made this distinction at the start of your speeches, right? That while the opening government is talking about helping victims and that we shouldn't ignore victims, the motion is effectively about asking them for their approval of any um, post-war resolution. Because we did obviously hear a lot of arguments coming from the deputy leader opposition on whether or not this would be equal, on whether or not the government is actually a good actor. And that's actually a key question in this debate. Who exactly is the best actor to decide what a post-war resolution should be like? Should it be the government or should it be the victims, the people who were directly harmed? So overall opening half comparison. So we do have an opening government that perhaps goes a little bit too narrow and mechanical. That said, uh, it's a little bit of a disappointment in opening up opposition that seems to maybe dismiss a lot of the concepts that opening government is bringing out as opposed to, uh, bring, uh, to, to refuting them head on. And also perhaps a little bit of a slowly developing case where the brunt of the strongest arguments are coming in the second speech as opposed to in the first speech. Uh, so that said, what ends up happening uh, at the end of this is, one, um, it is a challenge from the opening opposition. Uh, I would say that by the end of the exchange, a lot of their material does become far more relevant because of the question that you're asking. Because what they're uh, arguing is that governments don't have the incentive to want to help the victims, and you need this mechanism of having a specific law in place to help the victims. Thank you for your feedback. Now we continue on with the closing half of today's debate and to start us off, the Member of Government. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we begin, I would like to address what would approval mean in terms of war atrocities. Approval equals to listening in the voices of citizens, preventing them slaughtered to death without even gaining rights to pose an opinion. And I would like to focus, focus on the situation when the approval is made, since the debate has focused on the importance of approval and the help towards citizens itself. Approval means it's the victim themselves who have basically gave one's approval to participate in war. Then, if we think twice, it can mean that victims without approval equals that they would not like to risk their lives as a victim in war atrocities. And it is hard to imagine victims who would anticipate sacrifice to sacrifice themselves in an obvious situation and approve to participate in wars. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, my focus is that uh, war atrocities will happen only when potential fighters and citizens and participants of wars in nations are equally potentially capable to start off a war. There will not be a compulsory and forceful attacks, but an approved war of countries in equal stance. And this approval itself prevents war out of range of basic eth ethics. And if this approval of each and every victims become real, um, citizens and nations would be protected in a strong underlying international law which means that they would obviously not uh, be participated in wars if they would not like to risk their lives in an obvious situation. And this gains responsibility. Having all of the approval from the citizens to sum up means that the war would not likely be an obvious slaughter of one side of the war. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, in a situation of atrocity and uh, national chaos, Nothing is more important than having responsibility. And let's think about it. If victims and every individual in countries have approved on war and are responsible in participating in the law, it gives all of the countries participating in the law the core responsibility to rehabilitate their own countries and admit whatever outcome they would have. The approval of victims prevents further national conflicts between countries. And the approval of victims does not mean that people will guarantee uh, getting shot from the armed soldiers. Ladies and gentlemen, patriotism 
is what is essential in each and every individuals of, of the countries, but they cannot cover the majority to delightly participate when they know they would be killed. So what I'm addressing here is that there would be fundamental and evident reasons for citizens um, or nations to approve themselves as victims. And this ethical stability of each uh, nation's participating in the war gives responsibility in each and every country to build up special wolf welfare and compensation after war um, since they must be basically approved in order to get approval from any potential victims. And this would uh, be my refutation from the opposing team on uh, the idea of compensation after the war. And, and this compensation will help happen since there is no sudden or denied atrocities from uh, victims. And so in addition, receiving approval from victims in war atrocities will stay ethical whether or not a potential victims approve to participate in war atrocities or not. So to sum up, um, if, if, uh, if the victims do not, do not want to give any, any approval in participating in the war, then uh, the stance of ethics will remain by not forcing other people to uh, participate in the war that is not needed. And in other way, if the citizens have approved to participate in the war, that can mean that uh, the country can take uh, previous responsibility to take care of the citizens after the war and uh, uh, give, the si uh, give, the na uh, give national conflicts the stability uh, in any kinds of conflicts. Thank you. Okay, that was a member of government arguing for the motion. How persuasive was your speech? Let's find out. 10 out of 50 lights have been switched on. And we now continue on with the member of opposition. Please step forward to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. As we are now debating on the motion, any official government resolution of war, atrocities must receive the approval of victims. We strongly believe that this motion should, that this motion should fall. Now, before I move on to my arguments, I will be making some rebuttals on what the opening government and closing government has said. Uh, the, cl the closing government said that well, talked as if the talked as if the fastest and the quickest is not the most important. However, this is a point that cannot. I, I mean, sorry, the fastest and the quickest is not th is not the most important. However, there are many cases, especially in war, where the government won't be able to receive the approval of victims. For example, during war, many victims can die or get disabled. How is the government going to get approval of these cases? Yes, and this is a point that cannot be ignored. Now moving on to the, now moving on to the rebuttal for the, the closing government. Uh, the closing government asserted that, the, that with this law, the core responsibility will, would, be given to, would be given to countries. However, does she mean that the, that the, cur that the current government does not have the core, responsi the, the core responsibility of the people? No, there is a case. Uh, I want to be. I, I want to ask. Um, since the prime, yes. No. Essentially, war resolutions are compensations and negotiations that take place between countries after the war. What is so wrong with being slow after the war? Yes, I said that. I fast. Not being fast is also important, but I'm saying that that being fast is not the most important part because. There are cases like being disabled or, or getting murdered where people, where the government cannot get the approval of victims. Now moving on to my second argument, second rebuttal. The closing government said that the, core, that the law would be giving countries the core responsibility. But since the prime minister did not define the terms in the, mo in the motion and limit the, limit the law to Korea, I will be giving an example of further, further Further to Germany, there is an example of that Germany in Nazis, they did give a final compensation, but did not complete the did not complete the compensation and kept on giving further further compensations and felt the responsibility to care for this care for these victims. How can you say that they, they these situation does not have the core responsibility? I believe that the I believe that the governments without without getting the 
without getting the approval of the victim, you still has, no, thank you, ma'am, still has the uh, responsibilities to take care of these victims. Now, I will be moving on to the extensions. Um, the power of money and social status will inevitably get involved. The motion says, any official, any official government resolution of war at atrocities must receive the approval of victims. The country, the countries, the countries or corporates would, would at any cost try to intervene in the process, threatening or giving bribes to the victims. This would be a, in, uh, this would be an inevitable process. Uh, the opening, the opening opposition side said that um, there are other ways possible, and I would like to present an, another way. There is no real need to get approval of victims. All we need is a process for, for the government officials to perceive the importance and severeness and the understanding and empathy. Meeting the victims, talking to them for a certain time, and making the government Sorry. official... No, thank you, ma'am. Take a test to... Making the government of officials take a test to, to determine if they have the right if they have the right information of the historical situation will be an, will, would be an appropriate alternative to this situation. This would allow the officials to perceive the importance, severeness, and the understanding, also the em empathy of the, of the victims. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. I, I, for these reasons, I strongly, be strongly believe that this motion should fall. Thank you. Okay, that was a member of opposition arguing against the motion. One of his arguments was that there may be bribes and under-the-table negotiations and coaxing victims to approve the resolution. Let's see how many lights have been turned on. The count is 14 out of 50. All right, we move on to the last speaker from the government bench, the government whip. Please step forward to the podium. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From now on, I'll refute the opposition side. Um, so the opposition team has talked about the inequality problems being caused due to the insufficient civilian opinions being um, listened by the government. However, I believe that if the opposition really care about the equality, then receiving, um, receiving the victim approval will be a better solution than just ceasing to get the approval from the victims at all. The government's role to make a fair condition can be further preceded after we provide the law to, to actually require the approval of the victims. Before I summarize, I would like to emphasize the meaning of the war. Wars are the products of greed, sharing um, strong aspiration for power in overheated conflict. And it's definitely a tragic event in history that makes tremendous amount of human damages. Just like what the opposition have provided, for example, during the World War II, which is also known as one of the fatal and largest war in centuries, um, Adolf Hitler, the leader of Nazi, brutally killed thousands of Jews in concentration camps. This is still known today as morally unacceptable and an unforgivable act. How could such cruel act be preceded so fluently? It is because they didn't have the, they didn't listen, or they never received approval from the victims at all, at the first place. If if the was if if there was a law or treaty or, or anything that, pure ma'am. Yes. Did you just say that the Nazis' negative, like movements, were happened by because they did not get the approvals from the victims? Yes, and, and what, I mean by my, what I mean by victim here is not the government, but the victim the, who actually get influenced by the act, the negative act of the Nazis. And to continue, search mercilessly slaughter wouldn't have happened if they actually got the approval from the victims who actually get influenced by them. We strongly believe that there is no ev inevitable situation for wars. Mostly in history, the ones who first committed, who first pull the trigger for the wars were the developed nations, trying to expand their power and authority across the world. These strong nations invaded developing or underdeveloped countries and created mass atrocities that can, now, that can never be approved under the universal moral law. The victims, mostly innocent civilians, never got to pronounce an opinion for whether the war occur or not. That means that they have to take any consequences from the war regardless of their will. This, we believe, is definitely not a fair condition 
The citizens are not passive beings that, are, that fully get controlled by the authoritative government. These people need to have the right to actually speak for, them, speak for their own life. Our second point was the reason behind this approval. The victims who are expecting the obvious failure in the war will obviously not approve the resolution, just like the opposition, opposition um, first speaker of the oppos closing opposition said. Um, as I've said in the beginning, every physical war in the society causes damages. There can be wars without the loss of humans. This means that if they don't get approval from the victim's country, there likely won't be other ways to suppress the victim's nations physically. And further continuing the war is nearly impossible. Therefore, there must be reasons behind this approval. The countries who are participating in the war, developing or developed nations, are fighting for bigger benefits and stopping the war means that their goals will fail. And the reason why the victims are approving is that they are also prepared to fight for the power, the authority, and the benefits they can get by, the, by um, approving the war. Yes, we're making sense and explaining the possible situations of victims actually approving for the war atrocities. No victim, especially um, when, they get, when they get to decide, is going to approve the war when, when their lives are at the end of the precipice. Therefore, the approval from victims will be the solution to, the resp to respect the individuality and rights of the citizen and also act like a signal in the international society to show the state of preparation. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine that we're in the war situation. We, as normal citizens, are going to be in the victim position in this case. If you are exposed to war atrocities without any prepare any um, protection of the law asking for approval, there is no other way but to end our lives in the, on the cold-hearted war ground. Therefore, I would like to insist again that the approval of victim is needed prior to the war atrocities. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, that was the government whip arguing for the motion. Let's see the audience response. I'm seeing a lot of lights have been switched on. Let's find out the exact number. 30 out of 50. That puts the total for the closing government at 40 out of 100. Okay. We are finally on to the last speaker of today's debate, the opposition whip. Please step forward to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the opposition whip to represent the causing opposition side. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great debate. Uh, I'd like to focus on some points uh, presented by the opening government and the opening opposition and also the closing government. First of all, the government side mainly focused on, I guess, the two points. First of all, why the government should care about the victims, and second, why the rule of the law regarding this kind of getting the approval of the victims are needed. However, these arguments were, I believe, it is well rebutted by the opening government that they are pointing out that it, their arguments were out of track because they are focusing on the compensation itself, not about the, whether to get the approval for the victims or not. And also, about what the closing government has said, they mentioned about the, the making a law or the legislation is a great way to give a responsibility for the government to co give a compensation for the victims. And also, it is the <coughs> best way no. to... No, thanks, sir. Uh, Ma'am, sorry. And the... Okay. They mentioned that it is the best way to give a responsibility for the government to give a compensation for the victims. And also, it is a great way to listen to the victims like pain or the in the respect their individuality. However, uh, the closing opposition side, like, uh, um, as the member of the opposition has mentioned, like to give the alternative that can fulfill this kind of like, reasons better. Before, before we move on to our alternative, I'd like to focus on some points that the opposition side has mentioned. They mentioned, they mentioned yeah. that, uh, no thanks sir, uh, ma'am, and the, opposition, the opening opposition side has mentioned that the faster resolution can give a better compensation for the victims because um, the, and the closing opposition side believes that the compensation after the death of the victims are useless for them. If, they, if we respect the individuality, as the closing government has mentioned. And also, second, um, they believe the opening gov opposition believe the ability of nation. Nation itself knows what is needed for the nation the best. And lastly, they talked about the equality. So we have the, not only for the victims who were real, actually suffered from the war, not, and also not only them, but also the people who are living in the current society have the 
right to approve the approve the comp about the compensation. So he mentioned about the equality, and and I'd like to move on to some points that the closing opposition has mentioned. Um, first, the member of the opposition suggested one possible and efficient alternative. What we need is not a legislation regarding a compulsory approval for the victims, On but point, no, no thanks, ma'am. Um, but the true understanding and communication of government officials who actually participate and make official government resolutions. So the member of the government opposition presented the alternative that makes the process of com conversation with victims and the task that can be measured the understanding of the event compulsory for events compulsory for the government officials. And also, the closing op opposition is afraid of the risk that the power of money and social status may get involved if the process of getting approval of victims get or become re the most required process. Member of government presented about the possibility that certain situation may happen, so I'd like to explain the reason why this the occurrence of this situation is a really serious problem. First of all, this action, the situation that the power of money or the social status get involved in such process harms the major purpose of this legislation. We believe that the major purpose of this legislation to get the compulsory approval for, from the victims is giving a proper compensation and cure for the victims, and we agree about this point. However, if the power get power of the money or authority get involved, this purpose cannot be achieved because the true and the real opinion of the victims cannot be accept, accepted properly. And second, it's nothing more than giving another scar on victims' heart. Forcing, them, forcing victims to approve the legislation and even threatening victims with their power of money or authority is absolutely not the actions for them. It's just another painful experience for victims. So we believe that this kind of problems makes the, uh, makes the like, reason that these legislations must be executed weaker. Ladies and gentlemen, the opposition side strongly believes that this motion falls because um, as the op opening opposition said, uh, the faster resolution can c give, give a better compensation for the victims. The ability of the uh, nation itself knows what is needed for the nation for the best and lastly for the uh, and equality that the everyone has in the current situation. And also, we gave an efficient alternative that can cure or give a better compensation for the victims. And also, there is a kind of risk for risk of this legislation to give a threat or painful experience for your victims. Thank you. Okay, that was the opposition with arguing against the motion. One of our points was that forcing victims to approve will leave yet another scar on the victims' hearts. I'm seeing almost all the lights have been switched on. 41 out of 50. That puts the total for the closing opposition at 55 out of 100. Okay, all eight speakers have presented their case for and against the motion. Before I ask the adjudicators on their opinion, I would like to ask the audience for their feedback. Audience judges, if you agree with the government bench, please turn your lights on. If you agree with the opposition bench, please leave it off. On the count of three, make your decision. One, two, three. Okay, more lights have been switched on. Let's find out the exact tally. Okay, 38 for the government and 12 for the opposition. So it looks like the majority of our audience agree with the government bench. Once again, let's hear from our adjudicator, Sandeep Shilani. So I'll give comments to the closing government first. In debating, particularly in BP debating, it's obviously very important to differentiate from the opening half. And we thought you guys did this uh, well. You also have to be careful about not veering away too far from the motion. Having said that, there were obviously some interesting arguments that came there. Because if you could weigh, if all citizens could weigh into the decision-making process of a war, that would certainly, hopefully, lead to less wars. Potentially more wars, but hopefully it would lead to less wars. And certainly that argumentation was good. 
But insofar as the relevance of those arguments to this motion was concerned, unfortunately, it didn't really seem too relevant, right? And so again, it is important to be different from your opening government, but make sure that you're still very much relevant to what the debate and what the motion is asking of you. So talking about the closing opposition, um, I do feel that you try to differentiate yourself from, uh, yourselves from the opening opposition as well. Uh, that said, here are some things that I would perhaps uh, change from uh, what you ended up doing. One, uh, I think you were a little bit um, taken aback by the case of closing government and didn't quite know how to deal with what ended up happening there, right? And uh, I think strategically what you ended up doing is um, taking their case at face value, dealing with it, but then focusing more of your attention on opening government's case. So when you start attacking their mechanisms, what you then need to do is you very much need to be comparative, right? So if their mechanism has these harms, why does your alternative or things that the government can do alternatively, why is that better in these kinds of ways? In this debate today, I think there are a few questions in the debate that has to be answered upon. I wish team had done that well. So the first one actually is the relationship of government, war, and victims, right? The second question is that, do we need this approval, right? Could, could we just get inputs and be able to respond by our own middle government example? This one's quite lacking. And the last part, I guess, that had be, is the resolution. I mean, what, what it will look like. So I think that was something lacking of all teams a bit on pushing the debate further and just not putting small little points of the argumentation, but the bigger debate itself. But the best team who had to respond or engage or analyze these questions of all four. And, it was, and uh, one of the team did, uh, did well in that perspective. Thank you for your insight. Now it's time for me to announce the top team of today's debate. This team will go on to the finals for a chance to represent Korea in the 2017 Asian Cup. So, that team is... The Korean Minjok Leadership Academy, congratulations. Congratulations. How do you guys feel? Oh, we're, we're very excited <laughs> and um, congratulations for everyone. <laughs> to everyone? Do you think they put up a good fight? Yeah, we thought it was a very interesting debate mm -hmm. and we think that listening to the adjudicator's feedback, we felt that there are, were a lot of things that we missed, so we're mm -hmm. hoping to improve upon that. All right. Congratulations Thank once you. again. And you guys, how do you feel about today's debate? I am actually glad to be part of this debate and mm -hmm. I am actually very sick, so oh. I was in a bad condition, but mm -hmm. I, ho I hope if I had another chance, I would hope to do well. Mm -hmm. I think you put up a very good argument nonetheless. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and you guys, how did you feel about today's debate and just being on intelligence overall? I never really thought about this motion before, but it was really a good experience to be in this debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a great experience, and thank you for everybody for giving me this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And finally, how did you feel about today's debate? Um, uh, I think it was such a great experience, and um, sort of partially relieved that uh, I won't be uh, stressed again <laughs> <You're> <laughs> for any further. <laughs> yes, um, so, well, basically, I think it was a really good experience. And um, I just want to congratulate everybody who got the opportunity to participate mm -hmm. in this debate. Were you stressed out just as much as your teammate? <laughs> yes, that is the truth. <laughs> but um, I think it was a really great uh, opportunity for me to um, kind of face my limits mm -hmm. and acknowledge my ability. Right. So I'll try to work on my debating skills based on what the um, judges gave the comments on. Okay. Regardless of the result, I would like to congratulate all eight students because they've put up an excellent fight despite being given only 30 minutes notice of the motion. All right, we're already halfway through the semi-finals. Next week, we will select another team to advance on to the final round. So please do join us again. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye. <laughs>